go. Hello and welcome to another booktube video from me Lauren from Lauren and the Books. Hope you're all doing very very well. Today's video it's the next part of my bookshelf tour. So I've been slowly and I really do mean slowly because it's been over the past sort of I would say three years been working my way through my bookshelves going by colour picking out books from the taking books off the shelves showing you them sometimes adding them to my tbr for the next month sometimes getting rid of them so it serves as a bit of a book unhaul as well um and we're now down to black gray and white books today's books are black books that's why i've got my black top on so i'm going to work through all these black books what i will say is that the black books the black and the white books are hidden away in the, the dungeons of my bookshelves so they don't often get looked at now, as I said at the beginning, normally when I'm working my way through these um, uh, books, I add some books to my TBR. However, this month's TBR is books that are coming in the post, uh, stuff that's coming in at the library, so I can't add it to it then. And next month's TBR, which is one of my favourite TBRs to do, is David picking books off my shelf. So none of these books will be added to my TBR for any time soon, but there might be some that I want to get rid of. It's definitely getting a bit busy back here again and I only sorted them out not so long ago so yeah here we go well let's work through I've got two piles here one pile here we'll start with this pile so the first book is the Virago Book of Witches uh, this is edited by Shahrukh Hussain um, I put one of my lovely uh, not even Patreon sorry one of you lovely lot bought this for me from my um, wish list love this front cover I mean look at it it's got all sort of like witchy items here candle tarot cards broomstick wand Oh, lovely, lots and lots of stuff. And I started reading it last Halloween and I got, so it's separated, it's all story, like folklore and bits about witches. And the first section was about, and like, look, some of them are really, really short, alluring women and ailing knights. So I read that first section and then the next section is wise old women. So I will be getting back to that. Let's just have a look and see what it looks like underneath. Just simply black as midnight. Um, and yeah, I'll be getting back to that around Halloween time. Now this next one is one I think I'm going to get rid of because it's just been sat on my shelf and I don't know when I'm ever going to read it. And that's Machines Like Me by Ian McEwan. I think this is about AI. Britain has lost the Falklands War. Margaret Thatcher battles Tony Benn for power and Alan Turing achieves a breakthrough in artificial intelligence. In a world not quite like this one, two lovers will be tested beyond their understanding. It takes place in an alternative 1980s London. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ever going to get round to that, so I think I'll, I will I will get rid of that. Sorry, Ian. Uh, this one is Still Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. Um, this I bought after seeing it on one of Lena Norms' videos. Um, it's all about creativity and sort of like getting inspiration and stuff like that. I have read it. It was in my, it was in my bathroom for a long time. For a long time I had short little books in my bathroom as sort of like toilet books. Um, I Yeah, I will revisit that. I wonder if I'll need it again after. I'll revisit it. But then I think um, maybe that might be one for the go pile. Then I've got Inferno, a memoir by Catherine Cho. I must read this. This is about um, Catherine leaving the US to go to London um, to, no, sorry, the other way around, leaving London to go to the US um, to introduce her family to her new son. Um, and while she is there, she finds herself um, on a psychiatric ward after being admitted there involuntarily, I believe. Um, and in, in an attempt to hold on to her sense of self, Catherine had to reconstruct her life from her early childhood to a harrowing previous relationship and her eventual marriage to James. The result is a powerful exploration of psychosis and motherhood, at once intensely personal, yet holding within it a universal experience of how we love, live and understand ourselves in relation to each other. Yeah, I really will read that at some point. Then I've got a poetry collection by Jay Bernard. What's that in there? Oh, I thought that was a thing, but it's not, it's just a page. This is called Surge, and this was the winner of the Ted Hughes Award for the New Work in Poetry. And it also made the shortlist for the Costa Book Awards in 2019. Let's have a look. Jay Bernard's extraordinary debut is a fearlessly original exploration of the Black British Archive, an inquiry into the new crossfire of 1981. I think I've read that uh, poem. A house fire at a birthday party in South London in which 13 young black... Um, people were killed. I might have read this. If not, I'm going to read it again. I think maybe I've read a few or... Yeah, I'm definitely going to read that again. That sounds amazing. Oh my God, I've n I don't think I've ever seen this book in my life. By Sean Hewitt, Tongues of Fire. The poetry again. I literally have no idea where this has come from. 
It's published by Vintage. In this remarkable debut collection, Sean Hewitt gives us poem of rem, musicality and grace. By turn searing and meditative, these lyrics concerned with the matter of the world, its physicality, but also attuned to the proximity of each moment, each thing, the spiritual. Well, I never, I've never even... I've never even seen that, but I'll hang on to it. I've been getting into my poetry this year, guys. Then I've got um, the Penelope ad by Margaret Atwood. I remember buying this very well. I bought this from Armchair Books in Edinburgh when I was up there visiting, um, well, um, Brittany, uh, who no longer has a uh, booktube channel, and me, her, and our significant others went around Edinburgh to a variety of um, bookshops guided by the lovely Jean. And Jean said to me that this was one of her favourite books, um, and it's a retelling of the myth of Penelope and Odysseus. Um, and I remember buying it, and I will get round to reading it. To be honest, that probably belongs on the old grey books, doesn't it? But it's snuck in here. Um, then I've got Things Bright and Beautiful by Ambara Salam. I've also got by Ambara Salam, which is another one I really want to read, Bella Donna. This I picked up from a lush book club, um, and it is about when Beer Hanlon... Oh, Mission House was not built for three people, especially when one of them won't stop humming. When Beer Hanlon follows her preacher husband Max to a remote island in the Pacific, she soon sees that their mission will bring anything but salvation. From Advent Island is a place beyond the reaches of even her most fitful image imaginings. It's not just the rats and the hordes of mosquitoes and weevils in the powdered milk. Past the confines of their stuffy little house amidst the damp and the dust and the sweltering heat... Ru this is probably a good one to read at the moment, isn't it, because of the sweltering heat? Rumours are spread of devil chasers who roam the island on the hunt for evil spirits and then there are the noises from the church at night. Yet, to the amusement of the locals and the bafflement of her husband, Beer gradually adapts to life on the island, but with the dreadful events heralded by the arrival of unexpected, wildly irritating and always humming house guest, Advent Island becomes a hostile place once again and before long, trapped in the jungle and in the growing fever of her husband's insanity, Bee finds herself fighting for her freedom and for her life. Yeah, I will, I will read that as well, I will. This is a proof copy of The Harpy by Megan Hunter. This actually came out in June 2020. Um, the front cover is gorgeous, I think it's a woman with like a sort of feathery headdress on. Um, and this says, Lucy works from home, but devotes her life to the children, to their timely tuned, to their finely tuned routine, and to the house itself, which comforts her like an old sly friend. But then a man calls one afternoon with a shattering message. His wife has been having an affair with Lucy's husband, Jake, and he wants her to know. The revelation marks a turning point. Lucy and Jake decide to stay together, but in a special arrangement designed to even the score to save their marriage, she will hurt him three times. Jake will not know when the hurt is coming, nor what the form it will take. Oh my God, that sounds... I couldn't live with the suspense. As the couple submit to a delicate game of crime and punishment, Lucy herself begins to change, surrendering to a transformation of both mind and body from which there is no return. Oh, bloody hell, this sounds amazing. Yeah. We'll read that as well. Um, and then I've got, uh, just in this last part, I've got Glass Town Wars by Celia Rees. Another beautiful front cover. I don't know where this came from either. All these glass town intrigues, no matter how long you've been absent, how far you travel, once you were back, it was though you'd never been away. Tom and Augusta are from different places and different times, but they meet in a virtual world to combine forces in battle. David would love this. To save a kingdom, escape a web of deceit and to find love. In a place where fictions can be truths and truths fictions. Learning who to trust is more about friendship and it is about survival. Oh, actually, Glass Town Wars, because Glass Town is the Brontes, isn't it? Inspired by the early writers of the Brontes, is a captivating magical novel by the renowned Celia Reese. Bloody hell. All these little secret ones been sneaking away in old uh, book dungeon down there. Right, we'll move on to this pile. I'm going to bring it closer to me. Come closer. First one, Anna of Fra uh, Anna Frank, that's because I've been thinking about Anna of Cleves. Anne Frank's Diary, the graphic um, adaptation. This is adapted by Ari Foreman and the illustrations are by David Polonsky. David's mum bought me this. I don't remember reading this. This is one that, no, I must have done. Yes, I do remember reading it. I remember, it, it's a brilliant retelling of Anne Frank's Diary. Um, and would highly recommend. So yeah, I do remember reading that. Then I've got, which I haven't read, uh, Michaela Cole's Misfits, A Personal Manifesto. This got sent to me by the publisher following um, the very, very uh, successful I May Destroy You, um, which David watched. I never got round to watching. And this is her sort of like short personal manifesto. It's less than 100 pages. Um, I think it's been on my TBR before, but I didn't get round to it. I will read that as well. Um, then I've got Walking the Lights, a novel by Deborah Andrews. I remember being, no, or did I buy this second hand? Or maybe I was sent this by Freight Books, who I don't think publish books anymore. Um, 
Young actor Maddie lives a slacker life with her deadbeat boyfriend Mike. Estranged from her mother due to a violent stepdad, most of the young couple's me meagre resources go on drink and drugs, but Maddie and some friends harbour hopes of putting on their own production of Shakespeare's The Tempest. As she moves from one low-paid jobbing actor role to another, and from the abusive relationship with Mike to a talented artist, Alex, can Maddie confront the past and find a way of living in the present? Walk in the Lights perfectly evokes 90s Britain and in living those margins while others prosper. This is a compelling story of one young woman learning the life of an actor as she explores how to live life, negotiating the self-destructive temptations of young adulthood. Well, that sounds bloody brilliant. I've actually been thinking recently of doing a sort of like 90s TBR or a 90s readathon where we, where I, or other people can join in, read books set in the 90s and this would be perfect so there we go then i've got the seven husbands of evelyn hugo by taylor jenkins reed i bought this because it was second i bought it second hand somewhere and it was like perfect in second hand uh, condition and i mean to read this because i've read daisy jones and the six and really enjoyed it i've got malibu rising behind me which i maybe will get around to reading this summer no maybe not if david's not going to put it on my tv up next month but i've always heard wonderful things about this and i've always i, I put a reservation on the um the libby book uh, the e the audiobook on Libby and it's always got like 17 weeks so I know it's highly popular even now having been published a what a good long while ago let's find out how long ago 2017 um but yeah it's about a Hollywood icon and her a reclusive Hollywood icon and her um seven husbands um but yeah it sounds, um, it sounds great, and I'll, I will get around to reading it. Then I've got Period Queen by Lucy Preach. Life hack your cycle and own your period all month long. Again, something else I need to read, because I do have problems with my period. This looks like it's um, angled for a younger audience, which I'm still bloody down for. Um, lots of illustrations and things like that. So, yeah, need to get around to reading that as well. Then also from that same... I might get rid of this actually. Oh no, because I do like a bit of Janet Winterson. Also from that same um, Scotland Edinburgh book trip, I bought um, The Gap of Time by Jeanette Winterson in Blackwells. They do three for two in Blackwells and I bought this. I can't remember what else I bought. It was literally about seven or eight years ago. Um, and this is by Jeanette Winterson. Now I've read a few of Jeanette Winterson's and Christmas Days by Jeanette Winterson is one of my favourite books of all time. This is, I don't know if this is a retelling. Maybe it's not. A baby girl is abandoned, banished from London to the storm-ravaged American city of New Bohemia. Her father has been driven mad by jealousy, her mother to exile by grief. 17 years later, Perdita doesn't know a lot about who she is or where she's come from, but she's about to find out. Jeanette Winterson's cover version of The Winter's Tale vibrates and echoes of Shakespeare's original and tells a story of hearts broken and hearts healed, a story of revenge and forgiveness, a story that shows us what should be lo what, whatever is lost shall be found. The Winter's Tale, does that mean it is, oh God, don't fall over. Does that mean it is set in winter? Because then we can relegate that to winter later, can't we? Then I've got another proof copy. This is Laura Bates, The Trial. This came out in September, 2021. Laura Bates is the writer of many um, non-fiction books that I'm very, very into that talk a lot about uh, inequality, gender inequality. Um, and she is the, uh, the, the founder of the Everyday Sexism Movement. Um, and I believe this is a YA book about, I mean, it doesn't say, a survival story about the dangers of silence from multi-award winning author. There's no sort of blurb on it because it is a proof copy. No, it's not. I remember now it's got a plane crash in it. After a plane crash, these a group of seven teens washed up on the desert island. Their first thought is survival, but a terrible secret from a party the night before has followed them ashore. Facing deadly threats and the fear of being stranded forever, they quickly discover that being the most popular kid in high school doesn't help when you're fighting to stay alive. As the island deals each of them a dangerous blow, it's clear that somebody's looking for justice. Now survival depends on facing the truth about the party. Who was hurt that night and who let it happen? So yeah. Sounds great. Then I've got Milk and Honey by Rupi Kaur. This is a selection of, uh, I bought this secondhand as well. This is a selection of um, very, very, very popular in, like uh, poet poems. I think... She's sort of like the original Insta poet, if I'm right. Um, and a lot of these poems were put on Instagram with like these little simple drawings. So for instance, this one's called, well, is it, they're not called anything, guys. Your name is the strongest positive and negative connotation in any language. It either lights me up or leaves me aching for days. And yeah, I've been meaning to, um, to get around to them for a long time. And when I saw that it was... Um, uh, second hand almost a perfect copy I was like 50p yes please then I've got Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart which I will definitely definitely read I read Young Mungo earlier this year it's one of my favorite books of the year so far um this was the winner of the 2020 Booker Prize and yeah it's going to be amazing I imagine I, I think the themes are quite similar to Young Mungo in that it's about a young lad growing up um in Scotland I don't know whereabouts in Scotland Young Mungo was 
There's no, again, there's no blurb on here. I think it's Glasgow. There's no blurb on here either. So popular, doesn't even need a blurb, but yeah, I imagine if it's anything as good as Young Mungo was, then I'm gonna absolutely love it. Then I've got The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. This is a gorgeous um, naked hardback copy with this gold foiling in. I got this as one year, um, a company sent me a little book, a, a box uh, for a, as a gift, like the literary gift company, I think it was, sent me um, a box because they do uh, literary gifts, hence the name. And um, I got a Sylvia Plath box, which had this in, a pin with a Sylvia Plath quote on it, a um, t-shirt with a, with a bell jar on it. Um, yeah, very, very nice gifts from there. So that's why I've got that. And I, I, read, I haven't read that again since I read it when I was in university. I read it my first year. Um, I haven't read it since. This one, I remember getting this. This is from Granta. I love this front cover, Paulina and Fran by Rachel B. Glazer. I love the sort of like how free she looks at it in her sort of what I hope is a faux fur coat and these sort of lines and this yeah I love everything about it so it's about two friends Paulina is sharp-tongued and fearsome Fran is lovely and listless together they drive through drift through their classes at art school to mentor their fellow students and nurture their shared dreams of genius but when their burgeoning friendship tints from intensity into enmity our heroines find themselves divided from one another and set adrift in the increasingly disappointing world of adulthood enjoy that then the discomfort of evening by Marika Lucas origin of old this is t published by Faber. I think this won, it won a, I'm sure it won, the, did it win the International Booker or something? But this is from a Dutch author. A 10 year old jazz has a unique way of experiencing the universe. The feeling of udder ointment on her skin as protection against harsh winters. The texture of green warts like capers on migrating toads. The sound of blush words that aren't in the Bible. But when a tragic accident ruptures her family, her curiosity warps into a vortex of increasingly disturbing fantasies, unlocking a darkness that threatens to derail them all. Do you know what? I don't think I'd like that. So I'm gonna pop that on the old no thank you pile because i'm sure there's other people that would enjoy that more uh, then i've got these bodies of water notes on the british empire the middle east and where we met black spine beautiful front cover with this pink and teal and all of these dotties non-fiction it was out this year in may 2022 um and it's written from play uh, poet and playwright sabina mafuz um yeah and it's so here it says early on in the vetting interviews for my top secret clearance my interviewer asked me about rivers and canals what i thought about how the british had used them to maintain their empire until he asked i hadn't thought specifically about water and how it surrounded every colonial decision the british had ever made how one of the areas in the world i came from was seen as sand and oil dry and scorched but their water had enabled the empire and its legacy that i became a part of to expand and survive in ways that would have been unthinkable without it sounds like a bloody brilliant sort of history told from that point of view yeah, sounds fantastic. Fantastic. Um, then I've got um, A Paragon by Colin, McC Colin McCann. Um, I bought this second hand again. I heard Graham Norton talking about it. During lockdown, I remember seeing a video that went on Twitter of Graham Norton holding up two books um, just and having like a brief sort of like 30 second talk about what why he liked them so much, what he'd read in lockdown and these two books that he read. This was one of them. The other one was the one that I read by an Irish female author not going to get it, but I listened to the audiobook a bit. And whenever I, when I heard him talk about it, I was like, oh yeah, and the name has always stayed in my head. And I thought, oh, if I ever see it secondhand, I'll buy it. Rami and Bassan live in the city of Jerusalem, but exist worlds apart, divided by an age old conflict. And yet they have one thing in common. Both are fathers. Both are fathers of daughters and both daughters are now lost. When Rami and Bassan meet, they tell each other the story of their grief. They become best of friends and their stories become one story, a story with the power to heal and the power to change the world. Then I've got The Young Team by Graham um, Armstrong. This is set in 2005 in Glasgow. Glasgow is named Europe's murder capital, driven by a violent territorial gang and knife culture. In the housing schemes of nearby Lanarkshire, Scotland's former indus industrial heartland, we boys become postcode warriors. And then in 2004, Azzy Williams joins The Young Team, the YTP, a brutal gang conflict with their deadly rivals, The Young Toy, YTB, begins. And then in 2012, um, as he dreams of another life, he faces the toughest fight of all, the fight for a different future. So this sounds like a lot like um, Young Mungo. Expect Buckfast. Oh God, do you remember Buckfast? I had a terrible night in IV for after drinking Buckfast. Oh God. Expect bravado, expect street philosophy, expect rave culture, expect anxiety, expect addiction, expect a serious facial injury every six hours, expect murder, hope for a way out. Wow. And Damien Barr said, a landmark in Scottish literature. Sounds pretty heavy going, doesn't it? I'll hang on to it and see how I feel, but it does sound pretty, 
pretty heavy going. Um, Bad Girls Never Say Die uh, by Jennifer Matthew, who wrote the, um, who's the author of the movie Moxie, which came out on um, Netflix last year. Evie Barnes and her friends are the sort of girls who wear bold makeup, laugh too loud and run around with boys, but most of all they look after their own. When Evie is saved from the, unimaginable, uh, from the unimaginable by a good girl from the right side of the tracks, every rule she's always lived by is called into question. Now she must rethink everything she thought she knew about loyalty and learn that when girls stick together it doesn't matter whether they're good or bad. Oh, it's a gender-flipped reimagining of The Outsiders. And I loved The Outsiders when I was younger. I, that was one of the... I, I re-bought that when I just started BookTube. Um, I studied it when I was in year nine at school. Yeah, cool. We'll hang on to that. Uh, and then I've got an Ali Smith book, uh, Girl Meets Boy. Um, I've been meaning to read more Ali Smith. Oh, what's this in here? Where was she when this happened? Oh, yeah, I bought this second hat, so this is nothing to do with me. This was printed on the 2000, in 2013. And it is a train journey from Frankfurt to Mar. I don't know what that is, but yeah, that was in that was in the book when I bought it. I bought it from um, Oxfam Bookshop, I think, in Tunbridge Wells. But yeah, Girl Meets Boy. It's a story as old as time, but what happens when old story meets a brand new set of circumstances? Ali Smith's remix of Ovid's most joyful myth is a story about the kind of fluidity that can't be bottled and sold. It's about girls and boys, girls and girls, love and transformation, a story of puns and doubles, rehearsals, reversals and revelations, funny and fresh, poetic and political. Here is a tale of change for the modern world. Here we go. Right, we're on to the last pile. So let's get the last pile. Well, these are all quite big ones. So there's not actually as many in here as I thought. The first one is Circus of Wonders by Elizabeth McNeil. I must read... I've got two books by Elizabeth McNeil, which I haven't read either of them. The other one is The Doll Factory. The, the books that Elizabeth McNeil publishes, uh, the, writes and the published, so they're all published by Picador, they're all absolutely gorgeous. Look at this. Embossed gold circus stuff. The end papers are like beautiful stars and moons. It's set in 1866 in a coastal village in southern England. Bit like me. Uh, Nell picks violets for a living, set apart from her community because of the birthmarks that speckle her skin. Nell's world is devoted is is her beloved brother and devotion to the sea. But when Jasper Jupiter's Circuits of Wonders arrives in the village, Nell is kidnapped. Her father has sold her, promising ja Jasper Jupiter his very own leopard girl. It's the greatest betrayal of Nell's life, but as her fame grows and she finds friendship with the other performers and Jasper's gentle brother Toby, she begins to wonder if joining the show is the best thing that ever happened to her. And then it goes to London and the circus tours there. Yeah, it sounds bloody brilliant. I must read that and the doll factory. Uh, then I've got one of my favourite books. This is Tip in the Velvet by Sarah Waters. This is the 20th anniversary edition. I bought this secondhand because I love Tip in the Velvet and I've loved this front cover, uh, this um, edition of it. Naked hardback. Um, Sarah Waters is one of my favourite authors and um, I haven't actually read this copy because I read another copy. I think I got it out from the library actually. Um, but I'm definitely due a reread of this and this might be... This might be one of my Patreon book club reads. In, in November, for the past, past few years in my Patreon book club, we've read, like, my favourites. And I think this year, maybe, I will read a Sarah Walters book as my favourite. I don't know, but, yeah, it'll be nice to revisit that. But, God, absolutely love it. Then I've got a book that came out, I think, this year, Palmares by Gail Jones. Um, this is an epic tale of love and liberation set in 17th century uh, Brazil. Uh, Palmares how's the return of a major voice in literature, the best American novelist whose name you may not know. It doesn't tell you what it's about, though. It just tells you all about Gail Jones. In Palmares, Gail Jones brings to life a world full of unforgettable characters, reimagining extraordinary historical events and combining them with mythology and magic. The result is a sweeping story spanning a quarter of a century. Hence the bigness. From plantation to plantation, Almeida, a young slave girl, hears whispers, rumours of Palmares, a hidden settlement where the fugitive slaves live free. But can this promised land exist, and what is the price paid for freedom? There we go. It looks very... lots of words in there as well. Then I've got The Secret History by Donna Tart. Um, I read this for my book club at work many years ago, pre-booktube, pre, um, pre and very much enjoyed it. And I always think I will revisit it. I will revisit it. And it's... I've put it in bags to get rid of. I've gone to get rid of it and then bought, like taken it to work and said, oh, other people have a look at it and bought it back. I think I just want to read it again. I've recently, after seeing Mercedes talk about The Little Friend, got that out from the library. So, yeah, I need to have a, a Donna, Tart, Donna Tart reading session. Then I've got my... I, let, I borrowed this from my cousin Laura. This is Ship of Theseus by V.M. Stracker. Um, it's actually written by J.J. Abrams and Doug Dorst and it's an interactive book. So you're, you're reading the book, The Ship of Theseus, by this fictional author, V.M. Stracker, and it's written just like you would a normal book. But all of the books, uh, throughout the book, there's like little um, notes from two people to one another. And also things like clues, a postcard from Brazil, 
another postcard from Brazil, an older postcard from Brazil. But even down to like, I remember finding like a napkin in here with writing on and it's all, it all looks really real. And yeah, it's just a really, just looks like a really great interactive book. Now, when I was at Laura's, I did start reading this and got like about a, a few pages in while she was putting the babies to bed. So look, there we go, there's a bit of paper from a university. And I said, oh, can I borrow it? And she said, yeah, of course you can, but I'm, I'm really, I really want to read it, but I think it just needs a lot of sort of like commitment to, to sit to it. Um, but I will get around to reading it. I promise, Laura, I promise. We're on to the last three books. Next time we've got Ga uh, Bad Gays, A Homosexual History by Hugh Lemmy and Ben Miller. I got sent this this year. Um, and this is, as you may, may imagine, a history. Oh, I've got a little, po a little bookmark to go with it as well. An unconventional history of homosexuality. We all remembered Oscar Wilde, but who speaks for Bozzy? What about those bad gays who unexemplary lives reveal more than we might expect? Many popular histories seek to establish homosexuality heroes, pioneers and martyrs, but as Hugh Lemmy and Ben Miller agree, the past is filled with queer people whose sexualities and dastardly deeds have been overlooked despite their being informative and instructive. So yeah, an LGBTQ plus um, history published by Verso. I think it'll be great. They sent me a tote bag as well, I remember. Um, then I've got Heaven My Home by Attica Locke. I bought this la uh, in the first lockdown um, after hearing great things about it but then realised that it was second in a series. The first one is Bluebird, Bluebird, which I have read, um, and it follows a um, Texan ranger, um, what's his name, Darren Matthews. God, how do I remember these things? Um, he's black and um, you're, each book is a different case. Um, and a lot of them have links to sort of like racist ra racism and um, things like that. But there's also like the thread of him, his relationship with his mother throughout the books. Um, but this one in particular, I think, is about a young lad going missing who's from like a white supremacist group and Darren having to find him and having to work with all these white supremacists in order to find the son. I think that's what it's about, but yeah. And then the last book I've got is Ghosted by Jen Ashworth. Um, this is Laurie's husband Mark disappears, leaving behind his phone and wallet. For weeks she tells no one, carrying on her cleaning job at the nearby university, visiting her tricky dementia suffering father and holding up in her high rise flat with a bottle of wine or two to hand. When she finally reports Mark is missing, the police are suspicious. Why did she take so long? Wasn't she worried? Laurie's account of subsequent events raises even more questions. What makes her mistrust her father's carer? Why is she still fascinated by the long ago murder of a local girl? Does she really sense a strange presence in the flat? It's only when she looks back on her ensuing wreckage, the friendship broken, the wild accusations, the one night stand, that she begins to understand what lay behind it and how she might not repair the damage if it's not too late. There we go, sounds darkly humorous. So there we go. Those are all my black books. I'm getting rid of two, but hey, that's good. I can put that in. That's where they go, the ones that I'm getting rid of, straight in the bag. Like who knows um so yeah let me know if you've read any of these books let me know if you would prioritize any of these books and i'll see you again soon for another booktube video goodbye <laughs>